In the hierarchy of human beings whose footprints on history can never be erased for good or ill, he was perhaps unique. He was small and unkempt, brilliant and pitiless and unforgettable. He was adored and execrated in life and almost deified in death. He is remembered today wherever men's affairs have a meaning, with veneration or hatred, but never without respect. His name was Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, known as Lenin. <laughs> On the shores of the Volga, in a Tatar country, in the very landlocked center of the enormous empire of Russia, was the town of Simbirsk, one provincial town out of thousands. There, in 1870, in the respectable, solid, bourgeois home of a provincial bureaucrat, was born Vladimir Ilyich, the third child and second son. His family was simple and secure. His father was a government inspector of schools, a man of character and cultivation, Ilya Nikolaevich Ulyanov. Around them were always the reminders that to oppose the regime meant suffering. A thousand miles away in St. Petersburg, when the young Ulyanov was 17, the thing happened that was to shadow his life like a scar. His sister Anna and his older brother Alexander were implicated in a plot to kill the Tsar. Alexander was arrested, asked for no mercy, and was hanged. It was then that in his heart, Vladimir Ilyich became Lenin and committed his brain and his body to one end only, the revolution. From then on, he was marked the brother of an assassin. At Kazan, he was involved in a student's protest and banished from the university. Already, he had discovered Karl Marx, his personal revelation, the manual for his own place in history. Denied the right to study, he went to rusticate with his family near Samara. It wasn't hard for a rebel to find fuel for his fury in the country life around, in a Russia of a hundred million peasants who lived their racked and wretched lives forever on the edge of famine, scratching what they could from their outworked and ungenerous earth. It was not difficult in the Russia of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin to feel a bitter and ineradicable certainty of human wrong. It had to change. They let Lenin into St. Petersburg at last, to the law school. Here was the other side of the Russian picture, the urban proletarian picture. Here, as he sailed through his four-year law course in one year, he reached his creed that today's revolutions are born always in cities. On this proposition, he began to work. In his workers' lodging, he met the girl Nadezhda Konstantinova Krupskaya, the militant feminist Marxist, who by and by became his wife. Russia was changing, slowly groping to the new 19th century industrialization. The 19th century factories and workshops were huge and primitive. They were, like Russia, on a monstrous scale and, like Russia, suffocated in their own ineffectual size. In them grew a seething and inarticulate resentment expressed in all manner of groups of protest, the incoherent raw material of revolt with neither motive power nor guide. In the huge oil fields of Baku, rebellion was lost, as everywhere else, in an almost unconquerable pit of apathy. 
And above it all, ineffably remote, lingered the strangest phenomenon of all. For 400 years, the Tsars had ruled. And here was the last, Nikolai Alexandrovich Romanov. By the grace of God, Emperor of all the Russias. Tsar of Moscow and Kiev, Tsar of Astrakhan, Tsar of Poland and Siberia, Grand Duke of Lithuania and Finland, and much else. In 1895, Lenin went abroad for the first time, and in Geneva he met the founding father of the Russian socialist movement, Georgi Valentinovich Plekhanov, living in exile. Lenin was to become his bitter foe, but not yet. So he returned to Russia and founded with Julius Martov the forbidden League of Struggle for the Liberation of the Working Class. And he was arrested. For 14 months he stayed in jail. There was, of course, no question of a trial. Yes, he had abundant books, and he had no special trouble smuggling out of prison the revolutionary texts he was there for writing. He grew expert at the techniques of invisible writing and ciphers. At the end of his time, they sent him to Siberia. It took him two months to reach his place of exile, the Chushinskoya, far to the east. There he waited and hunted and shot and read and wrote interminably. Two years later, Nadezhda Krupskaya too was exiled to Siberia. The authorities obligingly let her join Lenin, and there she and Lenin were married. By now the Social Democrats were on the run. Lenin found his way to Munich, where, with Martov and Petrosov in 1900, he founded the rebel paper Iskra, the spark. It was smuggled into Russia by many people, among them the young Georgian activist Joseph Jukasvili, later to be known as Stalin. The paper Iskra became the underground gospel of Russian socialism. The workers' cells began to form in secret everywhere. Lenin's real wanderings began. His restless search for a secure base brought him and Krupska in 1902 to London, forever writing, haunting the British Museum reading room. Already the exiles were obsessed by their own internal conflicts. Sometimes it seemed the technique of revolution was more important than the end. But the flood of advice and instruction filtered back to the Russian underground. In Russia, the mounting miseries suddenly found a momentary expression in a wave of strikes and risings. And Lenin was still far away. It was the Tsar's bad luck, or folly, that brought at this moment the Russian war against Japan. A futile war, destined for disaster. In Russia, wars have always carried revolution in their wake. But the 1905 revolt began in a peaceful protest of almost excessive loyalty. A quiet priest called Father Gapon led 200,000 men, women and children to the Winter Palace, singing God Save the Tsar and praying simply for an eight-hour day. And the guards opened fire on them. More than 500 died. That was the bloody Sunday of January 1905. Everywhere the crowds came out in a chain of outbursts, defying the Cossacks, driven to a desperation of protest Russia had not known before. <laughs> this, thought Lenin from afar, must be it. The time for which he had planned. He hurried back to St. Petersburg. But he was wrong. The rising was crushed, the leaders imprisoned. In Moscow, the strikers held out a little longer, furiously encouraged by Lenin. In Moscow, the strikers held out a little longer, furiously encouraged by Lenin. But the army was still loyal to the Tsar, and the army had the guns, the cavalry, the resources, and the confidence. <laughs> 
the strikers had defeat and death. The 1905 revolt was confused and incoherent, but it brought the whole revolutionary mood into the open. The socialist movement was now an evident part of the political pattern of Russia. For those who did not die, there was the long, cold road to Siberia. For 12 years then, the revolt was over. Once again, Lenin escaped to rest and fled to Paris. There, in the usual back room of the exile's life, he wrote and argued and denounced all who disagreed. Lenin insisted that only he and his group of uncompromising Marxists were Bolshevik, the majority. The moderations of Plekhanov and his like were Menshevik, the minority. Capri, improbably enough, was on the list of revolutionary rendezvous. There, Lenin went to visit Maxim Gorky, and there were more arid intellectual contentions. In Prague, at the party conference of 1912, came Lenin's final breach with the old comrades. From now on, Lenin and the Bolsheviks were out to win the revolution their way. That year in Russia, the revolt stirred again. Of all Russia's melancholy workers, those of the leaner mines were the most enslaved and degraded. They went on strike, and the soldiers from St. Petersburg shot down an unarmed meeting, and 270 were killed on the spot. At that there rose in Europe a howl of horror and protest so loud, and in Russia a national strike so great, that a certain awe fell on the government, and a few tentative measures of conciliation came about. Lenin was closing in. He moved his base to Krakow in Galicia, but all this time another party was at work, the Okhrana, the Tsarist secret service. By now they were well on to the revolutionary movement. They had widely infiltrated it. They actually took part in smuggling the papers, and running the guns, meanwhile encouraging the schisms and retarding the movement. But, and it was somehow very Russian, even the Secret Service men were divided. Some of them became real revolutionaries. And now it was 1914. <laughs> Suddenly, all over Europe, multitudes of dissidents remembered they were loyalists. A wave of patriotism drove the conception of revolution into abeyance. Lenin was consumed with impatience. What had happened to European socialism? Where was the workers' solidarity that should quench this war? The Russian army was immense. In spite of its parade ground appearance, it was also unprepared, underarmed, underfed, ill-led and doomed. In their millions, the Russian soldiers vanished into the wintry wilderness of Poland to defeat after defeat, to catastrophe after catastrophe. At least four million never came back. At home, the privations grew almost beyond the point of toleration. The Russian mood alternated between hysteria and Slavonic despair. By 1917, it was a country ripe for chaos, and Lenin was not there. By now, he was in Zurich. What detonated the February Revolution was small enough, an industrial dispute in the Putilov Works in Moscow. The immense difference between this and all that had gone before was that now the soldiers were moving to the side of the citizens. Most of the garrison of Petrograd, as the capital was now called, moved over to the workers, the leaderless demonstrators who were now storming and parading the streets. This wasn't politics. The politics were to come. Now the Tsar had gone. He'd been challenged and had abdicated. 
four centuries, Russia had no Tsar, and it still had no Lenin. In the austere bourgeois peace of Switzerland, Lenin was frantic to return. The revolution for which he'd lived his life had begun, and he wasn't there. It would go by default. It would get into the wrong hands. Yet how could he, Lenin, cross the battlefields of a Europe at war? Petrograd, without a Tsar and without a Lenin, was now an arena for politicians contending for power. The seething impatience of Lenin and the exiles of Zurich produced a melodrama worthy of the times. The famous sealed train that no one might leave nor enter on its journey. The Germans, most eager to get a good disruptive force like Lenin back among their enemies, agreed to send him there by train. Some 30 men and women traveled on that famous train, the hard core of the exiled revolutionaries. Lenin, Zinoviev, Radek, Klara Zetkin, Sokolnikov, all pipelined through a Europe at war, back to a Russia they had none of them seen for years. And so, after 12 years, Lenin returned to the Finland station. The new battle was joined. The provisional government wanted order at home and victory in the war. Lenin and the Bolsheviks wanted the revolution under the control of the revolutionists and professional party workers, and they wanted an end to the war, any end. This Lenin expounded in the April thesis to the Petrograd Council of Soviets. The slogan was, Land, Bread, Peace. In 1917, then, the two ablest Marxists in the world were brought together again in guarded friendship with the return from America of Trotsky. His task was to be to end the war. In the minds of the soldiers, it was already ended. Everywhere along the German front, the opposing armies were fraternizing, grateful for any respite from this cruel campaign. Whole regiments packed up, quick, deserted. The Tsar's army defected in tens of thousands. Whatever might be said in Russia, their war was over. That much of the revolution was, for them, accomplished. In Petrograd, the revolution was established, and what had, in fact, changed? Lenin continually demanded that the provisional government give way to a republic of the proletariat and an end to the war. That July brought out 300,000 people into the streets. On the other side, Kerensky, whose father had taught Lenin Simbirsk. He was prime minister and he subdued the impatient Bolsheviks. Their headquarters, the commandeered house of the ballerina Kreshinskaya, was sacked. The left was routed. Lenin, disguised as a railwayman, slipped over into Finland indicted for treason. For now, the story was, Lenin was a German agent, sent in by the Germans, paid to end the war. He furiously denied it, but hiding didn't help. Now, in 1917, with Lenin still away, the campaign was on for the elections for the Constituent Assembly. The Bolsheviks remained in a high condition of exhilaration. As they had once cried, the Tsar must go, they now cried, Kerensky must go. Power to the Soviets. Yet, when the 42 million votes came to be cast later, the Bolsheviks were to get less than 10 million. The other social revolutionaries got 21 million, 58%. But Lenin said, the interests of the revolution stand over those of the Constituent Assembly, and on its first meeting, the Bolsheviks imposed their will. The Assembly never met again. Now both sides of this bitter division of the band of brothers were arming openly, and as openly making ready for the struggle for power. Lenin was still away, but his momentum had persuaded the Marxists of the town and the peasants from the disintegrating army to opt no longer for Kerensky and the Allies, but for Lenin and the end of war. The Tsarist officers faced with this dilemma were torn with uncertainties. Yet life went on. In some bizarre way, the social scene of the Russian capital continued to function for the phantoms of the old regime. 
Right to the end, the agreeable civilities of old St. Petersburg lingered on in their vanishing world. Lenin returned and the party's object was proclaimed, civil war. Now, in October 1917, the thing that had been a generation in gestation burst forth, the ten days that shook the world. The cruiser Aurora was ordered out to sea and refused to go. Street by street and building by building, the Bolsheviks took over. Only the Winter Palace was holding out. The Aurora opened fire and it surrendered. And out of all this sound and fury, victory came with practically no one getting hurt. In the Winter Palace it came through at last. Lenin handed over all power to the Soviet. For the first time, Bolshevik meant what it said, the majority. In an oddly pedantic phrase, Vladimir Lenin told the nation, we shall now proceed to construct the socialist order. But only now did the real problems begin. Now, for the Bolsheviks and for Vladimir Lenin, began the real struggle. As he dedicated the memorial to Karl Marx and Engels, Lenin knew this with a dire certainty. The bread ration was down to two ounces a day. There was no fuel for the factories. Lenin could and did ordain instant socialism, abolishing private enterprise, nationalizing banks and industry, annulling state debts. But he knew that the October victory had not abolished the forces of opposition. He foresaw rightly the coming civil war. But first he had to get out of the Great War, the World War. That was Trotsky's job. And at Brest-Litovsk it was done. Russia had lost almost a third of her population, a quarter of her land, half her industry. The capital of Soviet Russia was moved to Moscow, miles inland, less vulnerable, less identified with the vanished court. Behind the Kremlin walls, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin set up a seat of state authority. His personal apartments were ordinary to the point of starkness. He was, after all, used to austerity, quite careless of all possessions. Lenin at home with his wife, Krupskaya, the childless pair whose only offspring was an abstraction, a revolution. So enduring is the legend of perpetual motion, it's hard to believe it could ever be tempered by a cat. Not every Russian may have shared this euphoria. Many who had shared in no revolution, on the contrary, the officials and merchants who had opposed it, they too were set to work in the job of reconstruction. And they had no choice. The civil war was on the way. Lenin, reviewing the nucleus of the new Red Army, could only guess at what it might face at any moment. The one thing he needed was time and peace and opportunity to gain experience and consolidate. And that he did not get. The outside world now fell upon the conclusions of the Soviet state. The Germans marched on the Ukraine and ravaged it to protect it, as they loudly claimed, from the revolution. The British landed their marines at Archangel, more than 10,000 in a few months. They occupied it, overthrew the local Soviet, and marched on. In the Far East, there came the Japanese, 70,000 of them, followed by 9,000 Americans. Against all this, the raw and improvised Red Army. At first, it was only about 150,000 strong. Most of them already had three years of the Tsar's war behind them. They could have done without another. Now they had to contend with the world, it seemed, on a front of 5,000 miles. They were short of everything. Uniform, guns, food. Their great hope was that they would grow with partisans along the way. 
Soviets were beaten back all over Russia. To check this was the task of Trotsky. His work was desperate, fantastic, but we will look in vain for a word of praise in the Soviet records of today. All Russia was now an armed camp. This was, in effect, one world against another. The first confrontation of communism versus the rest. No one in those bloody days had a monopoly of cruelty or fear. At this time, there came an act that seemed curiously incidental. On July the 16th, 1918, the Tsar and his family were shot dead. The dynasty of the Romanovs was wiped off the face of the earth. In any case, death was everywhere. In August, it reached down for Lenin. As he left a Moscow meeting, a woman called Kaplan fired two shots. They hit him in the chest and shoulder. He nearly died, protesting, why should they make me suffer so? But that was not his time to die. He recovered quickly. By the spring of 1919, the counter-revolutionaries and the interventionists had taken six-sevenths of Russia from the communists. Moscow was under siege. So much hope was resting on the coming European Revolution, and a leader of the Hungarian Communist movement was welcomed as its envoy. When the workers everywhere had thrown off their chains, Russia would surge forward at their head. But was it when or if? All over Russia, then, the huge morale-building campaign grew. Here was the heyday of desperate oratory, the frantic argument that things could not be as fateful as they seemed. All the major figures of the party said so, endlessly, in a mounting desperation. Sverdlov, Kalinin, Molotov, Odenikidze, Stalin, all in their different ways insisted on the same thing. After all these awful years, must we lose now? Slowly it began to work. The recruits poured in. The partisan forces built up. They multiplied in their thousands, and they died in their thousands too. And slowly their growth came to exceed their extinction. Lenin spared nothing and nobody. He urged and demanded and insisted. He was without pity for anyone, including himself. It took three years. counter-revolution had collapsed, the interventionists were dispersed, and Soviet Russia was at last, and for the first time, on its own. The counter-revolution had collapsed, the interventionists were dispersed, and Soviet Russia was at last, and for the first time, on its own. In those fantastic days of 1920, the sun seemed to have risen at last, and the millennium was at hand. The infant experiment in the Soviet principle had taken on the giants of the world and held them and challenged them, and beat them. Here was the apotheosis of the career of Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, the prophet Lenin, the student and jailbird and exile and teacher and conspirator and doctrinaire of the century's most extreme philosophy. Supreme at last. But over what? A nation torn and destroyed and almost demolished a country reduced to scratching for existence among the debris of a fearsome and brutal war. Three years had been lost, or stolen. Lenin and the Soviets had been handed back a ravaged and derelict land, its industries beaten and broken to a standstill, its resources reduced to rubble, the very face of the country scarred and distorted, set back a decade. The nation's communications were almost totally broken to bits in a vast country where they'd never been adequate and now destroyed. This was the problem for Lenin. This was the post-revolutionary problem. 
for which none of the political revelations of Marx, or indeed of Lenin, had provided. This problem, at least, could not be solved by words, however skillful, however orthodox. Russia was now a land of refugees, three million people without a roof, freed from capitalism, and at the same time from everything else, depending now on a socialist state very nearly as desperate as they themselves. It created what almost all revolutions create, the new community of the dispossessed. The Soviet state was born to the sound of funeral orations. One by one, the old comrades of the revolution were seen into the ground. The coffins were painted red. There were no priests and no prayers. Innumerable men and women were committed to the Russian earth. Lenin buried them all. Thousands upon thousands had died at the hands of those who opposed the revolution and of those who made it. There's no birth, they say, without pain. Sometimes in those ruinous days, it must have seemed to Vladimir Ilyich that the price had been woefully high. There was, of course, a time and a place for symbolism, for the ceremonial laying of stones. Even revolutionary Russia places much value on ritual. Lenin could find time to inscribe plaques and formally consecrate them to communism. But there was so much more to be done. In the military field, said Lenin, we've won a complete victory. Now we must prepare for an even more difficult victory. The nation had virtually to be rebuilt, almost from the foundations. And almost the only machine in all the country to help was an inheritance of the war. There may have been some ironic symbolism as a byproduct, but the only thing that worked in Russia was a captured British tank. Lenin spoke endlessly throughout it all. Exhorting, insisting, demanding, arguing. It may have been rhetoric. Perhaps none of the Russians had any choice. The fact is that somehow or other this terrible job was done. The broken bones of the country were knit together with nothing except hands and feet and muscles and endurance. The simple hard technology of inexhaustible manpower. Life crept back to a semblance of normal, the elementary processes of peasant economy. The Smolensky market was in business again. It wasn't much, but it was something. It was now the end of isolation. The first Soviet state was gradually becoming the focus of one world attitude at least. At the Congress of the Communist International in Moscow, the delegates from 39 countries debated the program by which they were to overcome the world. They and the Bolshevik pioneers, Radek, Zinoviev, Lonichowski, Litvinov, the old guard and the new, including the American John Reed, journalist and historian of his times. Inside, they made their own history. Marx's old friend, Clara Zetkin. On her right, the Japanese communist. Then Yatayama, on her left, Zinoviev, then Smerov, leader of the Czechs. At the hub, always, Lenin projected his non-stop combination of magnetism and charm and petulant authority, with that characteristic thrusting gesture of the shoulders and the chin, the dominating oratory of a man who said everything so often that it merely remained to say it again and again. It was his manner, as with many a personally modest man of extravagant powers, to retreat, as they say, into the limelight. By crouching inconspicuously to write his notes in an obscure corner, he was assured of a maximum attention. Here was the apogee of Vladimir Ilyich, 
the summit of his tempestuous and uncompromising career. His sickness came quite suddenly. In 1922, his first stroke laid him low. He went to recover in the small estate in the village of Gorky. It was a hemorrhage of the brain, but it was not necessarily of great danger. He seemed to rally, and very soon he was talking as vigorously as ever, or nearly. He rested in Gorky with his wife, Krupskaya, relaxed with local children, was visited by the party's secretary-general, the young Joseph Stalin. That year he seemed to recover and hastened back to Moscow, to the Council of People's Commissars, to the Central Committee, to the Central Executive. To Lenin it was hard to accept that the business of the Soviet could continue without it. But by the end of the year, in the bitter winter, the second stroke failed him once again. And once again, Krupskaya took him back to Gorky, to the snowbound villa where, in the silence of paralysis, he was to come to an end. So, at half past six on the evening of January the 21st, 1924, in the 54th year of his tireless, tormented and triumphant life, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin died of a sclerosis of the brain. They took him back to Moscow, gripped in the ferocity of the numbing winter's cold. Tsar, perhaps no other human being was ever so saluted at his death. He'd been many things in his time, all to one compelling and obsessive end. Through him, many had lived who would otherwise have died. Many had died who would otherwise have lived. They set what was left of Lenin in the Red Square, and there, in body, he lies to this day. Of Vladimir Lenin, it was once said by Winston Churchill, the Russian people's worst misfortune was his birth. Their next worst, his death. One could admire the neatness of the paradox and wonder. The half century that separated that birth and that death transformed everything. But for what, neither we nor Russia have lived long enough to know. <laughs> 